Man, uh, we're in the, the middle of our series, uh, Series for Skeptics, and today's topic is a difficult one. Um, it's called My Body, My Choices, and when I first started to create this message, um, I, I, I tried to take it from the lens of, okay, we're going to talk about every single issue that we could possibly think of regarding sex or uh, outcomes of sex or anything like that. So we're looking at hard topics, any hard topics. So homosexuality or transgenderism, pornography, divorce, abortion. Um, and, and as I started to create this, I realized that would be a two-hour message, and we just don't have time for that. Um, and so we're going to focus on just one of the topics today. But that being said, I'm um, no, again, no questions are off limits. So if something that, that I say today doesn't uh, answer the question of what you have regarding the topic I'm speaking on, um, please ask one of us. Uh, I, I make myself available to stay after church as long as needed uh, to talk to you. And I'm always available to talk to you. And, and Jeff Zippy and Jeff Wench, who've been here with us the whole time, uh, they'd love to talk to you as well. And so please ask us questions. Um, I will say one quick thing on... Uh, the homosexuality debate uh, or just kind of sexual sin, uh, um, promiscuity or pornography or things in general and how we respond to that. Uh, the, the biggest thing I can say to you is, is something that Jeff Zippy talked about last week is objective and subjective truth. Is truth objective or is truth subjective? That ultimately is the guiding question around this issue. Because if there's an objective truth, which means there is a God or some kind of objective lawgiver, then we need to follow where that truth leads. Even if it's something we don't like or don't think is convenient for us, we would follow that truth because it's objective. But by contrast, if there is no objective truth and everything is dependent on my morality versus your morality, what I believe is different than what you believe, and morality is just kind of like picking flavors of ice cream, then it doesn't matter what the truth is. And so that's the big question we've got to answer. Objective versus subjective truth. And as a Christian, I can tell you where I stand on this. I believe that there is an objective truth. There's an objective moral lawgiver who is God. And he has declared certain moral laws. And so the big thing on the, the topic today, of course, we said my body, my choices. Well, as Christians, we don't believe that it's our body. We don't believe that it's our choices. Uh, there's a verse that I love. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. And it's Paul writing, and he says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Uh, so, Again, with, with issues uh, of homosexuality, pornography, we, we'd stay behind and ask, answer any questions. There's also some wonderful members of the congregation who've just, they heard that we we're speaking on these kind of topics, and some of them have been walking through these issues and would love to talk to you. So um, th th there's even an amazing woman in our church uh, whose adult daughter is um, currently uh, battling same-sex attraction and going, walking through that. And um, she has volunteered and said, hey, if any high schooler would love to meet with me or talk with me about it, I'd be happy to do that. And she's wonderful. And so come to me if, if you've got questions or you're interested in taking her up on that offer. Um, that'd be awesome. Um, so today, though, we're going to talk about a, a really heavy topic. We're going to talk about abortion. Um, it, it's probably the most controversial topic that's in your lifetime. It's going to be one that's going to continue to be controversial um, in your high, the rest of your high school days and in college. And uh, it's such an important issue, and it's such an important one to fully understand. And so before we even dive into it, uh, I just want to pray for us in, in our time. God, um, God, would you just take the truth of, of this subject and bring it to light. Father, would you just um, shred any arrogance or pride that I or anyone else has to think that we can change hearts or minds without you? Father, it's, it's you, and it's your, your truth, and it's true truth. And so, God, would it become relevant today? And would the, the science that you've established and the evidence that you've established be enough? Amen. All right, so 
It is a controversial topic. Um, I owe a ton of this content, by the way. A lot of this content isn't mine. I'm just presenting it. Um, the guy who I owe the most to for this is, is a guy named Scott Klusendorf, who is the uh, director of Life Training Institute. He's a brilliant apologist. There's a resource on the bottom of your notes page if you want more information. A lot of what I say today can be found on his website, among the other resources that are there. Uh, is where I have a lot of this information from. Um, so. So again, with abortion, again, controversial topic, um, and, and it's a sensitive subject. It's one of the most diverse or divisive subjects in our country. Uh, since 1973, when Roe v. Wade legalized abortion, we've had over 60 million children killed. Some studies estimate that one out of four women in the U.S. will have an abortion by the age of 45. And so for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground here, and I'm moving really fast. I'm going to be talking through a lot of statistics and things like that. And so I just want to make something super clear. This is a, an incredibly difficult issue. So I'm going to be talking as if I'm presenting a lecture because I need you guys to make a persuasive pro-life case. But if I was sitting with someone who's had an abortion, or who, if I'm counseling a student who's struggling and thinking they may have an abortion— the tone and, the, and the, the, the content of what I say is different. I'm still going to be speaking truth. I'm going to be doing it in love. I'm not going to be like, well, here we go. Notes time. All right, here's the PowerPoint slides. Let's roll them. Okay, break by break. No, so today, just know, if I was talking or counseling a student, I have had to counsel students in this youth group who are struggling with this, or parents uh, of students who, who have an abortion, and sitting with a, a mom whose teenager is pregnant, and the mom's weeping <laughs> in my office is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And, and I still have to stand again when she said her child's life is ruined and, and, and this, the, she's going to have a baby now to take care of and what's she going to do? Her only option is abortion and blah, blah. And, and, and I have to sit there and respond to that but still not compromise on the truth. And, and so I'm going to unpack what I believe is the truth today. And, and uh, so, and let you kind of decide for yourself. So abortion is a controversial topic, but it's not a morally complex issue. It, it, it's not. It actually comes down to a single issue. Despite what headlines might read, despite what liberal politicians sometimes might say, it's not about choice. It's not about scientific discovery. It's not about privacy. It's about one issue and one issue only. What is the unborn? That's it. That is the only question we have to answer. But so often Christians get derailed in arguing this point. And so pro-life people start accusing pro-choice people of hating babies. And pro-choice people start accusing pro-life people of hating women. And whether that's true or not, some people that are pro-life, they do say those things. Some people that are pro-choice do say those things. And some people that on both sides can be pretty dumb and horrible to each other. But that's not the point. It has no relevance on the main question. The main question, of course, what is the unborn? It comes down to two options. The unborn is a human being, or the unborn is not a human being. There is no third option. There's no in-between. So if the unborn is not a human being, then pro-choice supporters have it 100% right when they say things like this. Laws restricting abortions are unjust, and everyone but the woman should stay out of the decision. Yes, exactly. If the, if the unborn is not a human being, then we have no right to tell people to have an abortion or not. We, we have no control over that if it's not a human being. But if the unborn is a human being, then all of the arguments for abortion, all of the justifications for abortion are not sufficient. They're not enough because if the unborn is a living human being, then they have a right to life. That's the only question that matters in this debate. Here is the big pro-life argument. It boils down to these three kind of concepts. Number one, it is wrong to intentionally kill a human being. If you ask any skeptic, at least uh, uh, honest ones or ones that maybe um, haven't been in a, a clinical asylum, they will say, yes, it is wrong to intentionally kill a human being. And we can all agree on that in this room. Wrong to intentionally kill a human being. Number two, abortion intentionally kills a human being. Therefore, abortion is morally wrong. You see how that logic follows. If it's wrong to kill a human being, abortion kills an innocent human being, then abortion is wrong. Okay? It has to lead to that. And that's the main statement of the pro-life side. It's not an attempt to hurt women's rights. It's not an attempt to force people to take care of unwanted children. It is just, if it's wrong to kill a human being and abortion kills a human being, then abortion, therefore, is wrong. 
there's this popular bumper sticker that reads like this. It says, don't like abortions? Then don't have one. It's as simple as that. Don't like abortions? Don't have one. And this boils abortion down to subjective truth, right? It's a moral preference. It's like saying, don't like cheeseburgers? Don't eat one. Don't like Corvettes? Don't drive one. But this is intellectually dishonest, right? As Jeff Zippy talked about last week, morality is about what's right and what's wrong. It's not what we prefer. Could you imagine if this bumper sticker read this? Don't like slavery? Don't own one. What? Like, like you would be, people would be furious. Don't like slavery? Don't own one. Don't like murder? <laughs> Don't kill anyone. Stay out of my business. I can murder whoever I want. I can own as many slaves as I want. Don't like slavery? Don't own one. Right? We would think anyone that had that bumper sticker was insane. But people still want it both ways. So people will say things like this. This is the other argument you'll hear a lot. Well, I personally oppose abortion. I mean, I'm personally against it. But I could never force those beliefs on someone else. I've always found that a really strange argument. Because if abortion is not a human being, then why would you oppose it? Right? That's a weird thing to oppose. I personally oppose appendicitis. And I, people removing their appendixes. But man, I never force that belief on— I personally oppose getting my wisdom teeth removed. But I'd never force that belief on anyone else. See, if abortion's not a human being, it's no different than a tooth pull. Right? But if abortion is a human being, what a strange thing to say. That would be the equivalent of me saying— I personally oppose beating toddlers with baseball bats, but I would never force that belief on someone else. Well, yes, you would. If you saw someone beating a toddler with a baseball bat, you would absolutely stop that, right? We would jump in the way of that. And so the follow-up question is, well, why do you personally oppose abortion? If you ever have a friend, I, I, I can't even tell you how many times I had conversations with people in high school and college that I heard this line. And so if you start talking to people about this, you will hear this line. I personally oppose abortion. I would never force those beliefs on anyone else. So you say, well, why do you personally oppose abortion? Because if abortion is not taking the human life, it shouldn't be opposed at all. And so there's no middle ground on abortion. You either believe that each and every human being has a right to life, or you don't. I can't argue that point strongly enough. That's, that's the main thing. So we focus on just one question. Is the unborn a human being? So, again, here's some main arguments you'll hear on abortion. And just for the sake of argument and for the sake of showing the logical conclusion to this, I'm going to substitute the word unborn for toddler. Because what happens is we start talking about, well, what if this was a two- or three-year-old? Can you kill a two- or three-year-old? And the skeptics are going to say, well, no, of course not. But these are the same arguments they use for abortion. So, number one— Laws against abortion impose religious beliefs on others. Well, we have laws against killing toddlers. Do those impose religious beliefs on others? No. So if the unborn is a human being, then there should be a law, and it's not about religion at that point. Number two, we must respect a mother's right to choose. That's a very broad statement. Choose what? Does the mother have a right to choose to kill her toddler? No but she has a right to choose to kill the unborn. Number three, the federal government can't enter the realm of private family life. The federal government would absolutely stop a father from beating his child to death with a baseball bat. So we, the federal government does enter into the realm of private family life. Number four, many poor women couldn't afford to raise another child. Well, if a mother loses her job, does she get to kill her toddlers? Number five, a woman shouldn't be forced to raise a child that's unwanted. What if she decides that her three-year-old is all of a sudden unwanted? Does she have the right to kill that child? Number six, what about women who, are, who conceived in case of rape or of incest? Or of incest? If, if a child is conceived in case of rape, can, can we kill a toddler who is conceived in case of rape? We can't. What if a woman found out that the child would have had physical disabilities? Can we go around killing toddlers with Down syndrome? Can't. And so that argument doesn't work if the unborn is a human being. But the difference is, so, the, so supporters of abortion don't view the unborn as a distinct living human being. And so then we look at what the case is. Okay, well, what is the case? Is the unborn a distinct living human being? Zach, you've been saying over and over, this is the only question that matters. What is the unborn? Is it a life? Is it not? 
Okay, so here's the science of embryology. Okay, the science of embryology has conclusively affirmed from the earliest stages of life that the unborn are distinct, living, and whole human beings. True, they have yet to grow and mature, but they are whole human beings nonetheless. And leading embryology textbooks affirm this. I'm going to put a bunch of quotes up here. You're welcome to use your phones, take pictures of them. Um, if you want to see my notes afterwards, that's fine too. But um, don't feel like you've got to write these down. There's going to be a lot of long quotes. But these are, these are atheist embryology scientists, okay? And the developing human clinically oriented embryology, Keith Moore writes this. As I go to the beginning, is the beginning of a new human being. Human development begins at fertilization. The process during which a male gamete or sperm unites with a female gamete or oocyte to form a single cell called a zygote. This highly specialized, totipotent cell marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. T.W. Sadler's embryology states this, the development of a human begins with fertilization, a process by which the spermatozoon from the male and the oocyte from the female unite to give rise to a new organism, the zygote. Embryologists Ronan O'Rahili and Fabiola Muller write this, although life is a continuous process, fertilization is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, a new, genetically distinct human organism is thereby formed. And the Senate sub subcommittee on abortion says this, physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of a life of a human being, a being that is alive, and he's a member of the human species. There is overwhelming agreement on this point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings. The facts are clear. Life begins at conception. Human life begins at conception. This isn't like a Christian wish thing, like I read that psalm of you knit me together in my mother's womb, and that's the only thing I'm using to support my, my facts. This is science. Proven facts. Life begins at conception. As most of you know, my wife Alexa was just singing up here as pregnant, and we're expecting our first child in August. And we, we, we have this little app, and Alexa likes to show it to me. And she's like, our baby's the size of a uh, mustard seed. Our baby's the size of this. Our baby does. And then she can tell me all these things our baby can do. It's amazing. It's amazing. Here's what science has shown you about some of these. So I want to show you. Check out. This is actually a picture of our baby. Um, so there's our baby right now. This, this is our baby at, uh, I think, 12 or 14 weeks. Um, and so it, our baby's about 21 weeks old now. Uh, and so here's the thing. At 18 days, a baby's heart begins to beat. 18 days. 21 days, it pumps its own blood with its own blood type through a circulatory system. 28 days, its eyes, ears, and respiratory system are formed. 42 days, brain waves can be recorded and reflexes are present. At seven weeks, you'll see an image of your baby sucking its thumb. Eight weeks, all body systems are, pr are present. Nine weeks, before most women show or even know that they're pregnant, the baby can squint, the baby can swallow, the baby can move its tongue, and the baby can make a fist. At 11 weeks, the baby has fingernails and makes spontaneous breathing movements. At 15 weeks, the baby has an adult's taste buds. At 16 weeks, the baby can grasp with its hands. It can swim, it can kick, and it can turn and do somersaults that are not even felt by the mother yet. At 17 weeks, the baby can dream. At 18 weeks, the vocal cords work and the baby can cry. And at 20 weeks, the baby has hair on its head, weighs a pound, and is a foot long, and the child can recognize its own mother's voice. That's halfway through the pregnancy halfway through the pregnancy. And these are, th this is a spot where most people wouldn't even give a second chance, a second glimpse at aborting that child. And at 20 weeks, the baby can do all of those things. Now, people who are pro-choice make a lot of objections to this. And for the sake of time, I don't, have, I don't have a ton of time to get into all the different arguments, but here's the biggest one. Even if uh, what they say is there is no consensus on when life begins, there are only judgment calls. There's a very famous politician a few years ago. He said this in the Senate floor. He said, there is no consensus on when life begins. It's just a judgment call. It's a blind guess. Now, that's a bad objection for a few reasons. Number one, even if we didn't know for sure that the embryo is human, that's an excellent reason not to kill it. President Ronald Reagan said this. He said, if you're out hunting and you're not sure if the rustling in the bushes is a deer or your best friend, are you still going to open fire? No, of course not. So if we're not sure that the unborn is a human or not, why on earth would we kill it? 
Number two, just because people disagree doesn't mean there isn't a truth. People disagree on stuff all the time, but there's still an objective truth behind it. And number three, like I just showed you, there is clear scientific consensus on when life begins. So all this evidence of science po po points us towards the unborn being a distinct living human being. So then we ask the question, well, what is abortion? What does abortion do exactly? Is it just, is the baby feel pain? Is it quick? I mean, is it just, is it easy? No, no, it's brutal and it's horrific. So again, here's some quotes and these quotes are from pro-abortion, pro-choice people, okay? But they're also intellectually honest, pro-choice people. So Naomi Wolf, she's a prominent feminist author. She's an abortion supporter. She writes this in the New Republic. Clinging to a rhetoric about abortion in which there is no life and no death, we entangle our beliefs in a series of self-delusions, fibs, and evasions. And we risk becoming precisely what our critics charge us with being, callous, selfish, and casually destructive men and women who share a cheapened view of human life. We need to contextualize the fight to defend abortion rights within a moral framework that admits that the death of the fetus is a real death. It's not just a removal of, it's not just a removal of cells. It's a clear death. Camille Pagila, who's another feminist, says this, Hence, I've always frankly admitted that abortion is murder. There, that's pretty stark admission. Abortion is murder, the extermination of the powerless by the powerful. Liberals, for the most part, have shrunk from facing the ethical consequences of their embrace of abortion, which results in the annihilation of concrete individuals and not just clumps of incident tissue. Anthony Kennedy, he's a Supreme Court justice. He's an abortion supporter on the Supreme Court. The fetus, in many cases, dies just as a human adult or child would. It bleeds to death as it's torn limb from limb. The fetus can be alive at the beginning of the dismemberment process and can survive for a time while its limbs are being torn off. Dr. Carhart, who's the abortionist that challenged Nebraska's partial birth ban, has observed fetal heartbeat with extensive parts of the fetus removed and testified that mere dismemberment of a limb does not always cause death because he knows of a physician who removed the arm of the fetus only to have the fetus go on to be born as a living child with one arm. At the conclusion of the abortion, the abortionist is left with a tray full of pieces. So most abortion advocates, when intellectually honest, are going to assert that abortion is an intentional killing. So why on earth would they still promote it? Why on earth would they continue to allow it? Why aren't Democrats, politicians around the country rallying and saying, enough, we're not doing this? Well, because a lot of politicians on the liberal side and some on the conservative side too are saying that the unborn is a human, but not a person. And if you're giving me a blank stare, that's okay. That's a really random thing to claim. How can you be a human but not a person. So there's this example from um, Huckleberry Finn. There's a, have any of you read the book Huck Finn before? Tom Sawyer, yeah. Um, so Huck Finn, Mark Twain wrote this book uh, to show how stupid racism was, a lot of ways. And so Huck Finn says this. Uh, he, he goes on this, this boat thing, and he gets back, and his mom talks to him, and, and she heard that there was an accident on the boat. And she says, Huck, Huck, are you okay? And he says, well, no, we're all right, but we blow it out a cylinder head, like part of the boat blew up. And she says, good gracious, is anybody hurt? And he says, no. Well, it killed a N-word. And she says, well, that's lucky, because sometimes people do get hurt. You see, she made an assumption that the black man isn't one of us. It's a human, just not a person. But that's lucky, because sometimes people really do get hurt. President Obama, no better with the unborn. Here's a quote from President Obama on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. He says, Today, as we reflect on the 41st anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade, we recommit ourselves to the decision's guiding principle that every woman should be able to make her own choices about her body and her health. We reaffirm our steadfast commitment to protecting a woman's access to safe, affordable health care and her constitutional right to privacy, including the right to reproductive freedom, which is killing her child. And we resolve to reduce the number of unintended pregnancies, support maternal and child health, and continue to build safe and healthy communities for all our children. Here's the big part, because this is a country where everyone deserves 
the same freedom and opportunities to fill their dreams. Everyone, of course, but the unborn. The president's statement is begging the question. He's basically told us that everyone does not include the unborn. He just assumes it doesn't. So our job as pro-life Christians is to expose that assumption and focus the debate on the status of the unborn. So what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of skeptics would argue that because the embryo is not self-aware, it doesn't have a large IQ, it's not fully dependent on the mother, because it's in the womb, it should not have the same rights granted to persons under the law. So in the past, we discriminated and kept rights from African Americans, and they weren't granted equal protection under the law because they were deemed to be not persons. They were just deemed to be humans. But now with abortion, we discriminate on four categories. Size, level of development, location, environment, and degree of dependency. And so there's this, um, that there's this argument they make that there's four big differences between the embryo you once were in your mom's stomach and the person that you are today. Four big differences. But as Stephen Schwartz points out, there's no significant difference between these four things. And you can use this acronym. Again, this is, this is Scott Klusendorf and, and his website. It's an incredible, well-concise thing. SLED. Size, level, development, environment, degree of dependency. Let's look at the first one. Does size have an effect whether you can be killed or not? Now, true, embryos are smaller than newborns or adults. But why is that relevant? I'm the largest person in this room. For some of you, I'm like triple your size. Should I have triple the rights that you do? Your size has no bearing on your rights. So that's a bad argument. The second one they argue for, why an unborn is a human but not a person, the level of development. Well, embryos and fetuses are less developed than the adults that they'll one day become, but why is that relevant? Some of you guys in the room are freshmen. You're going through the big P right now. Puberty, you are less developed. So do I get more rights than you? Can I kill you because you're less developed than me? Some of you, your brains are still developing. Half the time, I feel like my brain is still developing. I don't think that people get to kill someone just because they're not as developed as someone else. And by that same logic, we would be able to kill people in comas. We'd be able to kill people that were sleeping because they, weren't, they, they didn't have the same level of functioning while they're sleeping than they do while they're awake. We'd be able to kill people with Alzheimer's disease. What about environment? Where you are has no bearing on who you are. Does your value change if you cross the street? Does your value change if you move to a different city? Can you logically be killed if you're in a different place? No. So then why would it make sense that you can be killed in the womb and not out of it. You know the difference? Eight inches. That's the difference of environment. Eight inches. If the unborn are not already human, merely changing their location can't make them valuable. And then the degree of dependency. Okay? They say, well, the unborn is fully dependent on the mother. It's fully dependent on the mother for life. So is a newborn. I can't just take a two-day-old baby and leave it in the sun and be like, cool, you got this. Take care of yourself. I can't do that to a toddler. Alexa can barely do that with me. Like, she, she can't just leave me and be like, all right, I'll be back in three days. I'll die, right? Like, I don't know what to do. When I was a teenager, I could make top ramen and burnt toast. That was it. I couldn't take care of myself. Do, do people get the right to kill me because of that? Absolutely not. If you have a relative who has Down syndrome, they're dependent on people to take care of them. We don't just get to go around and kill them. So it has no bearing on who you are now. So I've given you so much information. I've given you so much statistics, so much facts. So your head's spinning. You're like, okay, okay, just sum, sum it up. So Scott Klusenorf puts it this way. He says, look, what if you were asked by your skeptic friend, you said you have one minute, you have one minute to make a pro-life argument. This is what I think you should say. I'm pro-life because it is wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. The science of embryology establishes, it proves it, from the earliest stages of development that you were a distinct, living, and a whole human being. You weren't part of another human being like skin cells on the back of my hand. You were already a whole living member of the human family, even though you hadn't mature yet. And there's no difference, no essential difference between the embryo you once were and the person you are today. 
differences of size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency sled are not good reasons for saying you should be killed then, but not now. So to wrap up, you know, we, we think about, okay, well, what next? I have all this information, now what do I do with it? Students, I need you to walk out of this room not being afraid to stand up for the unborn. Speak for those who can't speak for themselves. You have the evidence. You know how to keep the main point on message now. You don't need to get sidetracked. Talk about lots of issues. The issue is what is the unborn? Is it a life? Is it not? And it's so needed. There's 6 million deaths since 1973. That is six times more people than the total number killed during the Holocaust. And it's not slowing down. Recently, all six Democratic senators that are currently running for president, they shot down a recent bill by Ben Sass called the Born Alive Act. This allows doctors to kill babies born alive. If, if there was an abortion and the baby still made it through the abortion, the doctor could still kill it even after it was born alive. It's literally infanticide, killing a baby. But that's in, that, that is consistent with the view that these people have, that the unborn is not worthy of life. And in this case, if a child is unwanted, period, it's not worthy of life. That's not a political statement I'm making. I'm not taking a Republican, Democrat stand. This is just a fact. These six Democratic senators running for president voted against this bill and turned it down in the Senate, allowing doctors to kill babies born alive. We have a lot of work to do. But even in this darkness, there, there's hope. And God is, God is so much bigger than this. And there's incredible pro-life groups out there. There's a Tree of Life Pregnancy Support Center right here in Atascadero. There's uh, Steve Wagner, who grew up here in Atascadero and the Wagner family. They have Justice for All operating out of Kansas, and they're doing some incredible things around the country. Scott Klusendorf and Life Training Institute, they're equipping and training students, thousands of them around the country, like we just did today, to, to make a case for life. There's this amazing organization called Save the Storks. They have this portable sonogram van. They park in front of abortion clinics, and they do free ultrasounds for women seeking abortions, because if you go into a Planned Parenthood and go in to have an abortion, the Planned Parenthood likes to tell you that they're all about women's right to choose, and well, maybe you could have the baby, maybe you can't. They're not. They don't offer ultrasounds. You, they, they, they don't t give you resources for adoption. They don't talk to you. About, they, they push abortions because that's what makes the money. So this, this organization has these vans, and they park outside of these Planned Parenthood clinics, and they say, hey, it's a free ultrasound. If you just want to come check out, if you're th considering abortion, it's a free ultrasound. I want you to take one a look at this video. It's one testimony of someone. I'm so terrified story. that, you know, I wasn't going to have this life that I didn't even think that I wanted. And they hooked me up to an ultrasound machine, and the minute I heard his heartbeat, like, everything changed. <laughs> And all of a sudden, it was, it was me and this other little person. And, you know, when you get pregnant young, you think, like, your, your plans are going to change and, like, your whole life is over. And that just wasn't the case. Like, it was just that now that I had this other little person to think about and to have dreams about. And he, having him has been the most amazing, the most rewarding experience in the world. Now he has a little sister and just seeing their relationship and, you know, how much they love each other and how much they've changed my life. There are thousands of women like her who went into one of these ultrasound vans and walked away from Planned Parenthood. There are statistics of Save the Storks. Four out of five women who go into these vans choose life. They walk in, they see their baby's heartbeat, they see their baby for the first time, and they walk out because they can't imagine they see that it's a human child, and they can't imagine doing it. So our job as believers is to protect and defend. Yes, this is a heavy topic. It's an emotional topic. It's a sad topic. It's a horrific topic. But we can't shrink back from hard things. We 
cannot shrink back from hard things. Our job is to speak up and defend the rights of those who can't speak for themselves. Proverbs 31, 8 through 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. That means without the basic necessities of life. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and of the needy. I want you to take one minute. There you have those one-minute takeaway cards. I want you to write down one thing that you learned that was new, a question that you have. I'm going to pray us out in a minute, and we'll break up into groups for a couple minutes of discussion.